And here we are with a little bit more on Class B amplifiers, some nice enhancements for us to look at. So we're going to start with a basic Class B output that we've seen before, something like this. We've got our NPN, PNP, run down to our power supplies, a couple of compensating diodes over here. Now what we're going to do a little bit differently, here's our output, but what we're going to do a little bit differently is couple this a little bit different. Um, instead of just coming straight in here for our signal, um, a more efficient way is to do something called a direct couple driver. And that looks like this. Down in here we're going to put a drive transistor. This comes off to our power supply, negative power supply. Um, we can bias this in a couple of different ways. A very simple way you might do this in the lab is with maybe a little voltage divider, something like this, and your input signal is going to come back in over here. Now the way this works is that we would set up a certain voltage back here on the base. Of course you'd lose your 7 tenths. We could establish a current through this first transistor which would then flow down through this connection here through these two diodes in the upper resistor. We would set this current in such a way that the voltage drop across this resistor would be just about equal to the positive power supply. All right, it would be the positive power supply less the one diode because this point here we still want to be our uh, zero volts reference point for our load. All right, we have a negative power supply down here. Um, so we would set that up bias would be as normal. We'd have half the su total supply here, half the total supply here. Right. Now one of the advantages of this is that we maximize the gain of this amplifier at the stage, right here, this drive stage. Um, instead of having a pair of resistors out here and then a collector resistor, by sort of subsuming it into the input stage, we reduce the number of components and increase the gain because the total resistance will be higher off of this collector. All right, so that's good. A little bit more gain, fewer components. Uh, it's, there's no capacitor either. That works out pretty well. Okay, so that's a very common way that we would um, see this configured, this direct coupled drive. Now another thing that we mentioned was an issue with excessive uh, load current and load power if the load was accidentally shorted or if the load itself was just too small. And the simple way of solving that problem is to put a fuse in line, but you know, fuses are less than ideal. So one possible uh, way of fixing this problem is to put in an active current limiter. Now looking at just this output transistor right here, this would look something along this line. Here's that particular transistor. And what we would do is we would put in a small resistor in the emitter. So here's the output. This is going down to the, uh, to the PNP transistor. And then across this we have another small signal transistor configured like so. Alright, so this point here is this point back here. So he's right in there. Now here's what ends up happening. Under normal circumstances, right, the current is flowing out to the load through this transistor will produce a small voltage drop across this little resistor. You know, maybe millivolts, tens of millivolts, maybe even a few hundred millivolts. But basically, that voltage is small enough that this transistor is off. So it's like it's not even there. We just have this little resistor in there. Now when the signal gets too large, when we get a very large current flowing, that will produce a larger voltage drop. When we get up around six or seven tenths of a volt, that will turn on this secondary transistor and it will conduct current away from the base of the transistor. In other words, instead of going into the base of the power transistor, it goes out this way. That means it doesn't get multiplied by the beta of the output transistor. The prior stage goes into saturation and that creates a current limit. We would of course have the same kind of thing down here in the uh, PNP. I won't draw the whole thing, but we'll have another transistor here to take care of the PNP side. So that's a very common way, it's an effective way of um, producing an automatic current limiter.
And then when the fault goes away, you know, if, if uh, for example, the consumer rewires it so there's no longer a short, nothing has to be reset. There's no circuit breaker, there's no fuse, um, it just works fine, okay? Now, what about a case where we have very high output demands? In other words, we're looking at an amplifier that's going to be producing hundreds of watts. Maybe it's driving a fairly small impedance like 4 ohms or 2 ohms, and we could be looking at, you know, well over 10 amps of current going out into that load. Well, the betas for these transistors are simply not going to present a particularly high input impedance. So what ends up happening here is that the drive stage winds up being a small power amplifier by itself. Right? So the, the way around that is to replace these transistors with Darlington pairs. And we would see something along this line. So I have a Darlington coming over here. All right. Now, the first transistor in the Darlington doesn't have to be a big power transistor. It's only the second device that does. All right, so this goes up to our power. And we see the same kind of thing happening down this way. Here's our negative power. Something along this line. Now, this, of course, will require four diodes because we have two transistors in each pair. So the little compensating diodes to reduce the notch distortion, we would need four of those. All right, so this, like I said, goes down to our negative power supply. So this configuration is pretty nice. Now you get the beta times the beta. Uh, this allows you to get a much greater Z in base. Um, the prior transistor stage, the drive stage, doesn't have to be uh, nearly as powerful. So this is a, a nice way to do this. This would be done discreetly, of course. We would have, a, like I said, a small signal transistor here and a large signal transistor here. Now, you might also see a variation on this, which is sometimes referred to as a quasi-complementary output, where this PNP power pair is replaced with a slightly different configuration. And it looks like this. This was common sort of in the old days when we couldn't get um, high-quality, high high-power PNP transistors. So we did this composite version, which uses one PNP and one NPN. All right, so basically here's the emitter, uh, here's the base, here's the collector. And this appears, it behaves, like just a PNP transistor. A Darlington PNP is what it behaves like. This is known as a Zikli pair. It's named after George Zikli, who was an American uh, electrical engineer. He developed this. So it's just a variation, if you can think of it that way, functionally, kind of like a Darlington. It has one nice advantage in that between the base and emitter, there is only one uh, base emitter drop. So instead of two here, right, and two diodes, we'd only have one diode to match this up, right? So like I said, if you have the Darlington up here and the, and the Zikli pair down here, uh, we would refer to that as a quasi-complementary output, All right? Well, if I want to go to very, very high output power, although the, the beta works out very well for the preceding case, we might not find power transistors that can handle both the current and the voltage requirement. So we can sort of double up on this or even triple up on this. And we would simply do a sort of parallel connection on these power devices, right? So here's my load coming out here. And we just, this is how we would draw the bases being connected in parallel, basically. And so this drive transistor feeds this pair of transistors. And this goes out to the load. Now, there is a practical problem with this in that these um, uh, bipolar transistors they have a positive temperature coefficient of transconductance. And what that means is, as they get hotter, they tend to conduct more current. And that creates a problem here, because you're never going to get transistors that are identical. So let's just take these two top transistors, and we say, well, just due to manufacturing tolerances, and we plug them in, maybe this thing is drawing 52% of the current, and this thing is drawing 48% of the current. Well, this is going to be slightly hotter than this. And because it's slightly hotter, it's going to conduct a little bit more. 
And what ends up happening is that 5248 very quickly turns into 5545. And now this is a little bit hotter yet, and this process continues, so that turns into, you know, 5842, and then it turns into 6040, 6545, and we have something called thermal runaway here. And eventually, one of these transistors will hog all the current and, you know, go into a sort of a, a thermal suicide, the thing dies. And of course, even if it, if it uh, opens when it fails, that leaves only one transistor to handle the full load current, so that thing very quickly dies as well. So we need a way of, of mitigating that. And a simple way of doing it, although it's imperfect, is to put small resistors in here, right, like this. Now what would happen is on the drive voltage, right, if we just look at these two, there's a certain input voltage coming in here. As the output current would increase, that would produce a voltage drop across that little resistor, which then forces the VBE back here down a little bit. And because you're pushing the VBE down, you get less current. You know, if you remember what the curve here looks like, right? If this is your VBE and your IC, you know, what we're doing is saying, well, that little resistor is going to force the operation from right from here to here. So instead of getting this current, we're going to get that current, right? And that helps to balance these two things since we have them on each transistor. And we might even see three in parallel out, you know, out here instead of just two. So this extends out. Um, end result, you could have, you know, 10 transistors in the output stage of this particular high power amplifier, but you would still sort of analyze it right back to our um, initial sort of circuit with one transistor on each side. Right? You'd kind of treat this trio or quad, whatever you have, as if it's just sort of a super version of this one idealized transistor back here. There is one more thing that you can do for very high output powers, and that's to use a bridged configuration. Instead of redrawing this whole thing, I'm just going to draw some little triangles and just say, okay, that's my power amplifier. Now, normally, this would drive our load, which I'll just represent with a resistor, as the signal goes up and down, right, when you have a positive input, of course, you know, we have a nice positive voltage across this, and then on the negative half, of course, this end goes negative and this end goes positive. This bottom part, of course, is always left at ground. So if we had maybe a 10 volt swing, then, you know, we'd have plus 10 to ground or we'd have minus 10 to ground, right? You have a 10 volt peak, either positive or negative swing across our load. Now, suppose I take two amplifiers. And what I'm going to do is take this signal back here, the original input signal, and I'm going to run this through uh, a buffer, a gain of one, but inverting. So if I have a sine wave here, coming out over here, I'm going to have a minus sine wave. And I'm going to feed that into an identical amplifier. Power. So these are my two power amplifiers. And then my load will be connected between these two. All right, this is called a bridged output. Now what's going to happen is, again, if I were to look at this 10 volt swing, at the extreme, this end is going to go up to plus 10 volts. But because of the inversion, this end is going to go to minus 10 volts. So I've got a 20 volt swing across that load. And on the other end, right, when the input's going negative, we're going to have negative 10 volts over here with respect to ground, and out of here we'll have plus 10 volts with respect to ground, which now puts us at 20 volts minus the plus. So we now have doubled the peak voltage swing. Well, you know, power is proportional to the square of the voltage, right? P is equal to V squared over R. So by doubling the voltage, you will have effectively quadrupled the amount of power. You know, the downside here is you can't have just a simple ground common. You have to run two wires to the load. So for example, in, uh, in a car, you know, in days of old, you would just have a simple car stereo, uh, radio, and you could use the chassis of the car as your ground. You could just run one wire to one, one loudspeaker, another wire to another loudspeaker, single wire. It was just a hot lead and you were done.
If you use a bridge configuration, you're going to have to literally run two wires out to those two loudspeakers. You can't just do that little shortcut of, of uh, putting the negative side of the loudspeaker to ground, to, to, the, to the chassis. You have to have a literal wire to it. So we add these things all together, we have some really nice enhancements here. And we can look at much higher output powers that are capable, you know, way beyond a simple uh, two-transistor configuration. You know, we wouldn't have to do any of this if we could simply buy individual transistors that had, you know, a beta of 5,000 could handle 50 amps of current at uh, 200 volts, you know, and only cost a buck a piece, you know, we'd be all set. But we go through these extra things, we add extra parts, enhancements, so that we can, in fact, increase the output powers. Now, if we want to go beyond any of this, uh, these days what we would do is sort of abandon the Class B amplifier and we go to a Class D amplifier, which is more efficient yet. Um, that's a switching configuration, which is in one of the later chapters of, of the text. Um, very high efficiency, though. You can get over 90% efficiency, 95% efficiency out of one of those. But it uses a completely different scheme. It's a switching sort of uh, configuration. But here we go. Nice uh, enhanced Class B amplifiers, Zikli pair, Darlington's, uh, bridge configuration, automatic current limiters. What more can you ask for?